All right, we are live. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So whether you're watching live or in replay, you, we have a really great show for you tonight. I am your host. My name is John. Though in the geocaching world, I'm known as GeoElmo6000, or as you can see, GeoElmo for short. I really hope you are all doing well. So before we get started, I want to describe the format of the show. I will be introducing my guests shortly, and we'll do a question and answer session with some questions that I have. But we do want you to be involved, so please make sure you write your questions in the chat on the side. If I don't get to one of your questions during when you ask it, I'll do my best to get to it at the very end. So please make sure you have your questions and your comments coming. So enough about me, let's get started. Today I have a very special guest, a geocacher, but who is also very well known in the geocaching world for his geocoin design. Please let me introduce Chris Mackey. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me on board. Sure, I'm, I'm very honored to have you on this show. So oh, I love to talk about coins. <laughs> <laughs> let's start with geocaching, though. So first, let's talk about geo your geocaching name. What is your geocaching name? My current geocaching name is I'm Hound of Fox and the Hound. It's okay. actually two different people. And, um, uh, Eric, Eric yeah. Fox is um, the gentleman who introduced me to geocaching more or less by accident. He was a hiking partner and a mountaineering partner of mine. Um, our wives worked together and they introduced us and then we started hiking and kind of just went from there. That's awesome. Um, and so like, when did you first hear about geocaching? You said you heard it from your friend. When did you first hear about geocaching? Well, we had been uh, doing some hiking in the mount, um, like the White Mountains of uh, New Hampshire, and it's kind of sketchy because the best time to go is in the middle of winter when it's like you know in the negative numbers and the ice is frozen and it's it's safer because everything is solidified. But we didn't really have a you know any sort of emergency equipment, so my parents had bought me a GPS to use, and I didn't know anything about it. So I just Googled, you know, how to use a GPS. And I found this site called geocaching.com. There was these forums that had lots of help. And so I bookmarked it and I thought, well, as soon as you get a chance, I'll read about that. And then we left for a two week um, trip, uh, just hiking all over Alaska. We didn't find out about caching until we got back. Oh no. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was unfortunate. So you, you never got that as a state front for your profile then? No. Uh, well, we did We did later. We went back. Uh, my family's from Alaska. I'm actually born in Alaska and raised. And so we, eventually we got it. But at the time, it was kind of upsetting. And it, we, uh, you know, I finally kind of learned a little bit more about how to use my GPS by going through those forums. And I really hadn't really understood much about caching. I was just talking to people in the forums. And then Fox had a neighbor had asked him if he was the mountain boys. And he, and he said, well, I, I don't know what you mean. He said, you know, the geocaching thing. And he said, I, I don't know what you mean. And so uh, he called me up and he said, do you know anything about this, you know, geocaching stuff? And I said, I, you know what, that's, that's, that's that website that I bookmarked on how to use a, how to use a GPS. And so I said, well, let's, let's find that out. He said, there's some sort of treasure hidden on the mountain behind my house. And so we started looking up how to use, you know, how to use that GPS I've been carrying around. And, uh, and it kind of just fell in from there. Um, we have terrible, you know, streak of DNFs to start with, but once we got the hang of it, uh, we were just hooked. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, you need to get those geosenses built up over time, right? <laughs> it helped to actually start caching with other people. Uh, I think the first six months of caching, we, we were using raw cords and a compass. We didn't actually know that there was a black arrow in the GPS that will send you to the cache. <laughs> so one of us would hold the, the fisheye compass and one of us would hold the GPS and you'd watch the, the numbers bouncing you know, back and forth. And it's amazing how fast your mind can compensate to figure out where you're going. We did actually pretty well, but it was a little embarrassing once we finally figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> so you started, you were born and raised in Alaska, but where do you live now? I'm living in northeastern Pennsylvania. So right along where it's kind of the tri-state area where New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania kind of all hit right there along the mountains. Okay. I've been to some events up there, the tri-state geocachers that have a, a great summer event called the tri-state treasures, which I go to every year. Yeah, it's a lot uh, of fun. So yeah, and I see and I see in the chat that we have some um, Pennsylvania cachers on. We have Captain Math and Angel, 
we have some Australian, we have an Australian geocacher, we have a, a New Zealand geocacher. So I want to say hi, welcome to, welcome everyone who was watching here. Um, okay, so what was your favorite geocaching adventure that you had, your favorite, your favorite geocaching experience? It would have to be Melissa. Um, there was a cache set um, in our area that was called um, Mount Myers, and it was a five or six stage multi-cache. And we had just sort of heard about this thing called a, a trackable. And uh, someone said that, you know, they're coins. And Fox is a coin collector, uh, a newsmatist, like someone who does the, the, the real, you know, valuable coins that, you know, he's always had an interest in metal detecting and finding stuff like that. So when he found out about the coins and he told me, I quickly checked the, you know, the site and I started learning a, bit about, a little more about it. And I'm like, oh, we got to do this. And I believe it was uh, Christmas Eve of uh, 2005. And we decided, hey, you know, we found those other caches so fast. How hard could it be? So we left in a hurry. I think we were wearing windbreakers and tennis shoes and then proceeded on <laughs> what ended up to be a many miles hike up and over the mountains. And then, you know, it turned into a snowstorm and we were not prepared. We almost walked off a cliff before we finally found the cache. Wow. But when we finally found it and we popped open that, you know, that big can in the woods and you have that beautiful clunk sound as it pops open, we started digging through, you know, just in hopes it was really there. And it was the most beautiful thing we'd ever seen. It was like Indiana Jones holding up the golden idol. You know, we'd found that coin. And it was beautiful. We took so many pictures of it and we took selfies and before selfies were even a thing. Okay. And we were so excited about it and we were just excited to be a part of it. And it was Melissa. It okay. was a two and it was the USA Geocoin, the plain old brass, no, no nonsense coin. But it was the coolest thing we'd ever seen. We were hooked. Instant in love. <laughs> That's great. So you've seen geocoins change a lot over the years then I see. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Some things that they could do in the past, they don't do anymore. Things that they never imagined that they would do are now just run of the mill. And so it's, it's a constantly evolving system. They're always introducing new ideas and new techniques. And there's some really amazing stuff coming up this coming year. Oh, that's cool. All right. I want to ask you a little bit more about geocoins. Geo Before that, I want to make sure I, I get people who are saying hello here. So we have Texas also being represented, Houston, Texas, Dave. Outstanding. I went, ca I went uh, caching once in Texas and uh, it, I was not, uh, I didn't realize that, you know, nobody but a fool would stick their hand in a hole to grab something. And uh, I grabbed a rock and the rock grabbed itself away from me. And I, you know, took a few steps back and I took a big stick and I pushed the rock and the rock moved back into place and I shoved it out of the way. And this huge spider ran out, grabbed the rock, pulled it back and went back in the hole. And I'm like, nope, keep the cash. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different areas. You don't know what to expect. I know Florida, I don't know what to look for. I'm always afraid to touch things. I don't, <laughs> I don't want it to bite me back. We, we have uh, Northeast geocachers, of course, like I said, being represented, Angel, and the tri-state geocachers, Captain Matt. So, and uh, like I said, down from, down from, uh, down under, we have our, my friend, see my shell who actually I'm going to be doing a, a trivia night with on Sunday, which is kind of cool. Outstanding. My first trivia night. It'll be kind of fun. Um, so let's talk about geocoins. So how and why did you get involved in geocoin design? Ooh, that was tough. Uh, I, uh, you know, of course we, we saw Melissa and fell in love and we said, we've got to do this. This is the coolest thing ever. You know, he was big on coins. I'm a designer um, as a professional. And so we had the tools and the will, we just needed to know how to do it. And it kind of, that was like the first step of kind of going down that road. And so the first thing I looked into was, you know, what other people had done and, and the budgets they had spent. And I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. This is terrible. I said, I, this is, you know, there's so much to invest in something that's just, just a hobby, just a game, you know? And, you know, of course we've only been at this for three or four months, you know? So the, the idea was a little, a little staggering to us to make a commitment. But uh, we, you know, started looking into it and I had a ton of questions and I was just ding-donging the uh, the people in the forums. And I had so many ideas about how to do a less expensive version of a coin or, or find other ways to do coins. Like the, what were the limitations of coins? The limitations in working with metal was a new idea for me. So I had a lot of um, things that I wanted to do weren't 
possible in a coin. So it limited me as a designer, at least I thought I did. And so finally, uh, someone pointed me in the direction, they gave me an email and they said, ask this guy, and, you know, he's, he's kind of knows everything about, you know, he's kind of like the Yoda of geocoins. He like, he can help you out. And so I started emailing this guy like three, four times a day. I was emailing him for weeks and he was so patient and he was so kind. And he, every time that I'm like, you know, he, he could have just blocked me, but he, every time he was answering me and it was great. And he helped me sort of make my first personal signature piece. And when it was done, I sent him one in the mail and he was like, that's great. He said, I'll send you one of mine. And a couple of weeks later, I got a package in the mail and I didn't, didn't know the name, you know, on the package or, you know, didn't really understand what it was, but when I popped it open, it was, a, uh, it was John Stanley's, you know, uh, wooden nickels. Oh, really? And I, I didn't know who that was. And then when I found, then I was like, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. You know, everything that I've been complaining about with coins, you know, here's the guy who sort of invented the concept, you know, uh, mountain bike. And here I am just going on and on about, you know, the limitations. But he was understanding because he's a guy that like understand the things evolve too. So, oh no, immensely grateful for him. You know, sort of helping me through those initial stages. Yeah, he's very he's very well known for his uh, geo coins. As Captain Mass says, the Yoda of geo coins, right? <laughs> that's pretty much it. That sums it up. Wow, so that's really neat. I I didn't expect to hear that. I mean, he's he's like I said, he's very well known for. For I guess the, the first geo coin, right? Is that his claim? One of his yeah. claims? Yeah, and it's, it was uh, it was really kind of a an, an amazing connection too there because the very first place that he put a coin was a place where he was kind of like inspired to to go that route to make that marker, and the place that he picked to do it was actually my very favorite place on the whole planet, and it's this this one little cove on a beach in the uh, Deception Pass Park in Washington State. And it was just, it was, you know, it, it was, I didn't realize that until like years later, I found that out and I'm like, that's amazing. That's, you know, that's the place that I always think of as my, you know, my, if my chords were, you know, were X, Y, Z, zero, 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 that would be my place. And so it was kind of neat that, you know, that that place was inspiring, you know, for two different people that both had a love for coins. Right. Wow. That's really cool. So this first coin that you designed, do you, I mean, do you still have it? Like one that you have? I have one. Um, I don't have one with me tonight. Most of my stuff is down at my office. And of course, we're combined to home right now. So I have some of my stuff here, um, bits and pieces. But the first one I actually did that it was an actual mint, you know, minted coin I actually did for someone else. Uh, they needed design help and I needed the experience. And so I basically did it for trade. You know, I got a couple coins for helping out and Jenny was fantastic and let me tackle it. And that was the UO trackers geocoin. Oh, really? Interesting. So um, that was a lot of fun. So can you tell us a little bit, like, so designing a coin, right? You come up with an idea. This is going to be a big question, I guess. Sorry, but yeah, we're going to probably circle around design, and design, design the product. I mean, as an engineer, this is what I think about. How does that go from your brain to our to the market or to, the, to your someone's hands? So it helped that I had a background um, in 3D modeling because I do uh, a lot of animation, you know, the sort of commercial animation, dancing cereal boxes, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I had a pretty good understanding of 3D, but expressing it in 2D is was the tough part. So it came down to a process of getting, getting an idea that's a good idea. Um, one of those quotes that I love to live by is um, Henry Ford, he said, you know, thinking is the hardest work there is and probably why so few engage in it. And, you know, it was kind of a harsh criticism, but the idea is true. The hardest work is coming up with a good idea, but I've come up with a few different um, sort of routes to narrowing those down. Um, and I think the biggest ones are make a priority list of what's most important to you. If it's a personal coin, what's most important to you? What represents you? What are the things that made you fall in love with caching? What are the things that you love outside of caching? make a list of the most important things in your life, even if it's just 20 things, and then really critically look at that list because inevitably you'll start moving some of those around and you'll change as you're thinking about it more and you, do, you know, dwell on it for a couple of days, spend some time. You're, you know, you're committing to a, a real, you know, a real big decision. And as that happens, you sort of reprioritize the things that really matter in your life. And it's amazing. It sort of sorts itself out for you. 
And when that initial sorting out happens, then everything becomes more clear. And if you're working with a designer, it's incredibly helpful for us because you tell us what's more important to you and then everything just kind of falls away. And then we see the order uh, you know, falling together when we go to do the design. Okay. So it's kind of an evolving process and you'll go back and you'll change things. You know, that's inevitable. You'll, you'll be halfway through a project, you don't have an idea and you'll start all over. Um, a lot of times I will wake up in the middle of the night and write down an idea and go right back to sleep. And then in the morning, I'm trying to decipher what it was that I was thinking of the morning before or the night before trying to figure out what I wrote down. But some of those ideas are just things that were, they were gelling there for a while. I've had ideas that I've sat on for, you know, 10 years or more before they finally got turned into a coin. Okay. But then those coins are also ones that really mean something to me too. So you come up with this idea, right? Now you actually have the ability to create that on, you know, on the computer or right. how to do that. So can you take us through the steps of like, now that either you come up with your own idea or you're doing an idea, you're putting together something for a client or a friend, how does it go from your brain to the computer and then eventually, like I said, to a manufacturer or a coin creator? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> it's a, I'm sorry. If it's a big question, I don't... No, it... My, um, my screen, you can see this is the workstation I actually work at. So... Let me bring that up. What I have is actually a large... You know, my monitors are maybe... I think they're like 27 inches wide. And I have this large pad over here on the right and where the, you see the mouse sitting on. And it's a 13 by 19 inch like workspace. And I use a stylus, it's like a magnetic pen. Wow. And so when I'm working, I'm working in one inch to one inch. You know, what's a one inch on my pad is one inch on the screen. So I'm actually drawing right into a program on the screen. And so that helps me immensely when it comes to doing this. Um, and then when it comes to the idea, I have people send me a priority list. Um, I used, I'm gonna use an example today of uh, the Lynn County Conservation Geo Tour. They came to me with an idea for a coin and they said, we want it to represent the wildlife in our park. And so they talked about the most populous wildlife, the things that people come to photograph, the things that people come to see. And they sort of gave me a list of those items. And I was able to sort of put that first and foremost was that squirrel, that gray squirrel, and then the oaks that they're known for. In fact, their county seal has that great oak tree. And so, and then some of the other the common parts that are some of the animals that are um, being preserved or saved by that, that system. So I had an idea and I kind of put it together and gave a sketch and we looked at it and we said, well, we like this and we don't like that. And we sketched around a few times and this is kind of what we ended up with. But then I have to go from this sort of cartoony sketch to an actual, you know, concept art. And so this is the next step is to get it to look like this so that when we do a 3D coin, it all matches. The layering is perfect. The shadows fall the way they should. This, you know, even though in the original photograph, you don't see the squirrel holding the nut like this, we need to make it look like it belongs that way. It needs to be believable. So, but once we get that all put together and we'll go over that a little bit, you know, a little bit later, we submit what's called an elevation map to the mint. Now the mint will look at this and the mint has their own set of artists and they'll use my artwork and my guides and photographs that I provide for them and other, you know, separate pieces of artwork I'll send individual layers. And they'll rebuild for their die cutting software what we need to do to make this, you know, sort of come together. And these, you know, these map, these different colors represent different depths, you know, depths in the, of metal that goes down into the coin. And then, you know, above that base height, that sort of middle level, you know, the, you know, the metal comes up above and it gives them a standard to draw by that allows them to not have to question the depth as they're cutting into the, you know, into the machinery. It makes their work. The communication from, um, from us to China, the biggest part we have is a, is a language communication. So if we can show them in a picture, you know, picture says a thousand words. If we make that pictures really obvious, it makes it that much easier for them to understand. And so we give them the best that we can. And of course, these are very low resolution. The stuff that we send them is about six times bigger than this. But when they do this, they'll go at their end and they'll recreate at their end what is the mint die art. 
and they'll recreate what's going to be cut into the metal. And I would look at this original piece and I said, oh, I like this, but we need to work on this. Um, I need this, you know, he's more pronounced. I want, you know, I, I want the turtle's head to be slightly lifted higher, you know, more like the photograph. You know, I want to move this down. I need a little more depth around the body because, you know, I need a little more shading here. Can we make this deeper? We'll go back and forth. And on average, we might go back and forth between two and eight times on any given design. Once they have it all right, and everybody's happy with it. The client looks at it and they said they're happy with it too. We'll send it in and have a die cut. And then that's the result. Wow. And if you don't if you've done the work and you've stayed true to the original concept, you can get really great results. And we have, you know, we've been I've I've found that one of the things that is really, really done well is um animals on coins. They I don't know what it is about their carvers love to do animals, anything representing animals. And they just, they did great work and I was super happy with this. But that initial concept of getting that, you know, from that sketch here to this piece here is where all the work is. I can say 85% of the work is after the thinking is, is just getting to this stage. Wow. And so that's what I would, you know, we'll have to break down a little bit more. How many times do you have to go back and forth with somebody to, to, I mean, typically to get that right? You're talking about, oops, um, you're talking about, you know, the depth, you know, I guess, is, so is depth like equal to like the different shades then? So like if you're seeing contour in the, like. Yeah, can, exactly. Uh, so if you can see the difference in the metal here where it's really dark here, it's all the same metal. And it's being sprayed with a sort of like um, like a lacquer finish, and that lacquer finish has a very like fine smoky powder in it. So they kind of spray the whole coin with this. It's all the same depth, and then they'll polish it. And when they polish it, the highest heights, the stuff that sticks out the farthest of the, from the top, you know, if you look from the side view, the stuff that's highest up gets the most um, burnishing by the polishing wheel, okay. and so that'll be the brightest. So you'll need these areas that, you know, where you really need them to pop, you want them to be as proud of the coin or as high out of the coin as possible. And the darkest points, which would be behind this, these areas where they're almost black, that's where I've sunk it as low as I can. And I've also enclosed the space as much as I can. So both shadow and the inability for the polishing wheel to get in and dig that, that dark uh, lacquer out keep it nice and dark and keep our contrast high. Wow, that's really, I mean, that's just amazing that, so you're not even just using shading, but you're using like the fact that it's deeper and the light can't get to it to make it darker. And this is, yeah, and and this is on 3D where it's easy. Now where it gets really tough is when you get into like imitation hard enamels where it's like looking at the bottom of a pool. You have to change your colors by the depth of the bottom of the pool. And so that introduces a whole new layer of of uh, options and, and ability to sort of express more. One color choice, but maybe 10 shades of color are possible. And wow. so that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. Okay, so that, I'm sorry, you can keep going. I don't wanna interrupt what you're saying. No, no, if you have a, if you have a question, fire it off, but I'll show how that 3D works, like how it, what it took to build that coin. And so a lot of times people ask like what's involved. So I have that initial sketch and what I'll do is I'll put it over a colored background and I'll start to work my way up. So I'll add, I'll add, you know, the basic shape of the coin. And I want that, I want that leaf background and I'll start adding the color variances to get it right. So this particular coin, if you notice, it's a little bit more symmetrical than nature would make it. Mm -hmm. So this is what we actually did is you take this initial piece and I've blown it up for that background, but I actually cut out a leaf and I changed it at a very specific ang angle and I repeated it one up, one down, one up, one down, one up, one down to go all the way around to okay. make it a nice even pattern. Then I put my overlapping rings, which are where, which are going to highlight those five, you know, supporting images add a little bit of flourish to the outside edge, 
and then start adding in the space where those supporting animals will go. Then I had to start building the squirrel. Now the squirrel is actually a bunch of parts. I, you know, your multiple multiple pictures of squirrels. So I've got to I've got to build the shading. Let's this piece, you know, this piece here. So I built shadow a shadow that will go behind the hand. The hand that'll actually I wanted a hand that had you know it's behind some grass here, but I actually want it to look like it's holding that nut. So I actually have to build a hand. Sometimes you just have to illustrate a hand, and you got to get that nut in place, you know, and make sure that it's within that shadow so it looks like the squirrel's holding it. Wow. When you get all that done, you can actually apply the squirrel and get him all put in there. And it looks like he's coming through that hole that's made by the leaves. Right. Yeah, you really see a 3D effect from that squirrel com coming out of the out yeah, of the leaves. It looks like it's popping right out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then we add some of the some of those other elements that are coming in. One of the things that I uh, ran into right away that I noticed is like, well, some of these are going to have to be behind the squirrel. For him to look like he's popping out, some of these have to go behind him. So they'll have to go on a different set of layers. So you'll have some that are behind and some that are above. And I have to keep all of this in order as I go. And you can see just, just to get to the background, we're already dozens of layers in. And then you start doing your reference pieces and adding all your animals. The next thing you know, you've got two or 300 levels. And I've already thrown away most of this. This is just a cleaned up version to show what's involved. We get a snake in there, have another look at the squirrel photos, make sure it's correct. And then we're good to go. Wow. And then we may change this, you know, three or four times before it's until we're right where we want to be. But that's inevitable, you know, inevitably that's kind of what you have to do to get that step, to get that final result. So that so the, the final so is it, what we're looking at right here is that like on the on your bottom left of your screen like that you just made a little smaller is that the final the final what it looks like when you're done with it? So well, this one, it this is um this is what it'll look like that I present to the client. This one that's sort of this golden color because we're going to make it in gold or copper. Then. Once I get that right, that's when we go and they're like, and I get the approval that it's okay. No more changes to make. That's when we make this one. This is the one that the mint is going to need to make sure all their levels are correct. Okay. And I'll have to do, I'll have to convert all this stuff to grayscale. And it's not as simple as changing your color mode. You actually have to go in through LAV layering um, color levels and use color temperatures because a red and a green um, while though looking wildly different, um, you know, to the normal eye, if you turn them both gray, they can be the exact same gray. So you use color temperature mapping to actually break that down. Wow. So there's there's a little bit of a goes into making that happen, but it's kind of what you need to do to get to that step. Now a lot of people, you know, they see that and they're like, well, that's that's. Oh, great, but that's not you know that's 3D. I don't I don't want to do 3D. I want to do 2D, like the sort of like cartoon or cell animation, and that's when you kind of go into a whole different look of of how to. I'm going to use another example of how to draw it out, and a lot of times it'll change what you can do for color um, as, of the metal. If you're using a translucent enamel say it's a uh, a blue enamel and you're putting it on a gold coin well blue and gold make green so all your colors are going to be wrong so there you start getting into a little bit of a uh, of magic going that direction as well so here's another example but this time it'll be 2d where we're just using a flat coin um we wanted to do this you know this uh wetlands protection piece so we have to actually build up the individual parts and pieces. So we'll take pictures of a, you know, of, you know, the, uh, the swamp grass and cattails, and we'll actually draw it out and make it fit. Now we have to, you might have to move it around a little bit to make it fit correctly, but we'll get there. You get your background water layers. We add those cattails back in in color. And then you start building the ducks. Now the ducks, just to give you an idea, is you know, here's a photograph. I found the photograph. I got it cut down to fit into that spot perfectly. But now I actually have to draw them out. 
So it'll literally be a matter of picking a color. Oops. And I'll actually, I'll usually try to pick some obverse color and I'll literally spend four, five, six hours drawing this little tiny spot, you know, drawing this lines, drawing these little tiny pin tail, you know, definition in the, in the lay of the feathers. And when it's all done, I'll have this piece. And I can turn it back off, add the colors back in. And then we've got a 2D version of the same piece. Add in that extra text. And then it's a matter of making sure everything matches, everything you know looks correct. And I try to design both sides of the same of a coin at the same time. Um, I found that in the beginning, concentrating really hard on one side, you'd almost use up all of your sort of creative juices to tackle one side. And then when you got to doing the other side, you're just trying to get it done. And I, I'd seen that happen before. And it was one of those things that I strive to avoid. So I try to make a point of designing both sides at the same time, at least through the sketch and at least partly through the comp. And then when I'm working, I'll actually load up an image and keep that in mind, keep the colors in mind while I'm working, keep the feel of it so that it looks cohesive from side to side. That's so cool. I'm going to pop up a question here for you. Yeah. How can we contact Chris to employ him to design our personal geocoins? <laughs> uh, you can email me. Uh, it's Chris at Aura Design Group. At, uh, or, yeah, Chris at Aura Design Group com, Or you can reach out to me on Facebook. Um, you reach me through Instagram at Geofox and the Hound. Or just comment, you know, contact me on Facebook uh, as Christian Mackey. All right. Um, thank you. Oh, and the website, of course, or designgroup.com. Okay. I'll try to put links in the description after this. Sure. Uh, I've seen your website, so I'll, I'll make sure I put a link in there. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a lot of this comes down to one of the things I run into a lot is people say, you know, I thought I thought there would be more detail or, you know, it looks, it looks like there's room for more detail. And I, I have to remind people a lot of times, like this fill spot in the eye, on this little tiny white spot in the eye, is actually a smaller diameter than a sewing pin. <laughs> and so when these are filled with color, they're actually being filled by hand with someone who has a hypodermic needle and they're putting, they're injecting the liquid into one little tiny spot at a time. And if they spill it over, they have to throw it away or wash it off and start all over. So one spill, one small mistake, and you just start the coin from scratch again. Is there a certain? Is there a certain? I'm just looking at this, this all this detail. Like, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, I don't know what you're talking about. Is there like a certain density that you have to worry about as far as detail? Because like, if the coin is very small, you may not physically be able to fit certain detail in. Is that true, or is that not true? It it is. Um, and I've had I've had requests for an, an inordinate amount of detail, and I've I've actually caused my problems for myself by putting in too much detail. But I know. I have enough experience now that I know that there are basic sizes. I have line depths and I can adjust my line. And I have to work within that size. So I know that working at this particular, you know, size at 2000 by, well, this is 50, I don't know why this is 15. It's normally 2000 by 1600. It's three by four ratio. When I'm working at 2000 by 1500 pixels, I can only use, you know, a number four brush that'd be this size here that's the smallest the metal can be and that's that's actually pushing it a little bit um you know reach for the stars catch the moon kind of idea but i do have to be careful there are minimum areas that can be filled so i know that at any spot that's less than nine pixels by nine pixels it can't be filled so when I go to do this reflection on the eye, it has to be at least this big. It has to be at least nine pixels wide, nine pixels long, or they're not going to fill it. They'll just say no. Okay. And so that's one of those things that I learned mostly by accident, by screwing up enough times that I learned what to do. And luckily, I've, you know, over the years, I've had enough chances to, to improve that each time it's become less of an issue. Okay. But I can show you a little bit about why that happens, too. Um, when it comes to cutting a die, there's a couple different ways to do dies. Um, and 
I see if you want to come back to to full, I'll show you what a die actually looks like. Okay, let me do that. Um, when it comes to cutting a die, something that people don't realize is is the the physical the physical journey of actually making a coin is so absurdly complex as far as and brutal as far as what it takes to do. This would be this was a die that I had made or that was made for a club coin. I don't know if I can get it to and I can make it bigger so people can see it. Hang on. Oh. I'm get the focus. All right. So that's the coin piece. All right. So what happens is here's that's one side of the coin. That's the other side of the coin. All right. This little piece of tool steel, or it's harder than tool steel. It weighs probably about 22 pounds. This piece right here, it's literally stressing my arm to hold it that high. This is on the receiving end, the heavier one. Then a collar goes on, on top of this and they put a liquid piece of, you know, well, it's a piece of metal that's so burning hot that it's almost liquefied. They'll put that in there. They'll put the other die on top and then a 120 ton hammer strikes it at about 200 miles an hour oh my goodness. and smashes it. And when it pings and pops loose, it has the indentation. So when you hear about, you know, the dot, you know, when, when they tell you your, um, the details to find it cracks the die, what they're talking about is those little tiny ridges of raised metal are actually snapping off because that incredible stress is just, it's so high that nothing could withstand that. And so that becomes, it becomes a little bit of a, of an art form to make sure you give them enough metal in some of that fine detail that you don't end up cracking your dies and, and adding extra cost to a project. Because then you'd have to go back and redesign it to be a little bit more sturdy, right? And yeah. And yeah, make it sturdy or change the process. And so that's what, that's a true, a true struck die. So it's actually two pieces of metal. Both have dies cut into the into the forms, and they're smashing together and leaving an imprint. The other way to do it is an injection mold, and that's you'll see they're a little more common. You'll see in the small square, about two inch by two inch box, and it'll have a bunch of holes in one side and a bunch of holes in the other side, and they will liquefy um, the whatever your alloy base is, whether it's copper or zinc or brass. They'll liquefy it and they'll inject it under pressure, and it'll fill up from one side to the other. And when it cools, they'll pop it off. And it's kind of like the old, if you ever made a plastic model where it came on the rack and you know, it had the little pieces and you'd twist it off and you'd sort of sand those edges. They're making them just like that, but out of metal. So you would get these pieces where it's an injection mold like that. And the last way is a spin mold. And that, that's that you have to use the softest metals for that, but they make a mold that basically gyrates like at a super high speed while the liquid is being injected into it and it shakes it into the finest crevices. And then, then they'll, they pop that out, you know, invert it and the coin pops out and you have some, uh, you have, you know, your finished product and it still has to be cleaned after that. Mm -hmm. So even after it's initially made, it still has to be chemically cleaned and sometimes physically cleaned a little bit too. So there's a little bit of variance in all these coins. Um, Oh, you were asking about um, pre prepping a, um, a coin for the mint. Right. Do you want me to bring up your screen? Yeah, I have another image. This is a coin that was completed, uh, um, I think, last year. Yeah. I have a comment here, too, from my friend Cash the Line that he has a trackable geocoin book and loves it. Oh, thank you. That's a, It's a cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we what can get into that. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, yeah. What what this was, when I came up with this, there was no height chart for metals when we started. And it came out um, by the second or third coin that I designed. The biggest communication problem I had with Mint was them understanding that I didn't want everything to be the same level. They were used to the idea of a coin having this. You know, here's the surface of the coin. Here's the recessed part. But what if I only wanted it partly recessed? or a little more, or what if I want piece to stick out a little bit? To explain that, I had to build this piece. And I said, this is the base level or the height of the edge of the coin. 
And this is how far I want you to cut into the coin, or this is how far you want to come out of the coin. So in this case, the green of this, you know, the feather and the blue of the outline of the body, I want that, I want that crow to be, or raven, you know, crow to be up above the base elements of the coin. So it kind of stands out a little bit. And so even though it's 2D, I don't have quite the impact of the 3D squirrel sticking out. I still want it to pop a little bit. So to get that squirrel up above, or get the raven, rather, crow, corvid, up above these elements that are below, I had to somehow show the mint, you know, bring this metal up a little bit. And so this is where we kind of came up with the idea of the elevation mapping. Um, when initially, the very first blueprint I ever looked at, it was just two colors. And I thought, well, if they have two colors, I'll, I'll do three. Because they showed, you know, here's the high color, here's the low color. And I said, well, let's just add more. Um, we got up to six levels, but before we were told never again. <laughs> and then only one mint gives us five levels that I know of. <laughs> okay. There are a couple that, that might be talked into it, but for the most part, they'll, they'll do four, you know, three or four, no problem. Five is depends on the design, but this is a, uh, it, it made a huge difference in how we set this up. It also helps me as a designer to be able to look at these and see where I'm going to run into problems where I have two elements of the same height that are about to run into each other. And then it gives me the ability to adjust all of this before the mint ever sees it. It gives me a little more flexibility. So why this matters is because they have to cut these dies. And I'm going to show you a coin that has no enamel in it at all. And there's an effect called keystoning. So you have these like super high speed bits that are cutting the artwork out for your for your um, coin. And this bit, this, you know, if you ever seen like a CNC machine moving on like the how it's made, this, you know, this machine comes along and it cuts it along and it pops down into, cuts it along, comes back up and pops it down, cuts it along. Well, as it's going up and down, it's leaving these little slopes these little mountain slopes along the metal. And if you go from a very high point to a very low point, they get really wide. And you can see this a little bit on these letters because they're, they're raised up so high and you know, they, and then they, where they slide down to the lowest level, they are really, they're really deep. And so you can see the depth difference between here to the inside where it's filled with color to here on the outside where it's all the way at the bottom to the lowest level. Okay. It's almost twice as wide. And that keystoning effect is why there's a limit to how small and how close you can get on your lines. If you have two, you know, if you're only allowed four pixels a brush, I can't put four pixels at the highest level right next to four pixels at the lowest level because there might be eight pixels of this edge going down in. Right. And the only way to, you know, it's just only experience, you know, taught me that, but it was hugely important later because I realized a lot of the problems that I was having when it came to design weren't the fault of the mint, which I couldn't understand why they wouldn't just give me what I wanted. The fault was I was giving them bad information to work with. I was giving them an impossible situation and they were doing their best to give me what I la asked for without making an edge so high that it would be snapped off when it was hammered. And so I learned to be a little more, a little more, I guess, discreet in when, you know, and how close I would put something together. I would need to remember that, you know, even though it seems like, it, you know, an easy thing when you're working on a nice big computer monitor, it's pretty tough at the tiny, tiny levels where they're filling this with a hypodermic needle. Wow. So soft enamel, when they put it in, like I said, it's come through a hypodermic needle. It's actually, it comes in and it's about the consistency of water or alcohol. It's very thin. It spills very easy and they have to be very careful with it. They'll fill it close to the top each time. And then they'll put it into an oven to bake and harden. And when it hardens, the liquid has evaporated out and left this hard residue behind. Depending on how much or how small this area is or how big the area is, it could change the consistency of how, of what that color is if you're using a translucent color. So say this was like 
you know, a blue, like, um, like a translucent blue, this color would obviously, cause you're looking this way, you're, look, you're looking through a lot of material. It's going to be a very dark blue. Mm -hmm. Whereas this wide spot with a low edge, it's a very tiny amount of material. So it might be a very pale blue that can either be, that can either work against you or for you. If you keep it in mind when you're working, you can actually use it to get extra colors out of the same enamel. Okay. So you can actually reduce the cost of making your coin because you're using less, you're using less enamel colors, which means less work for the mint and you're getting more colors or more variations of that color at your end. So then you have what's called hard enamel, which is, they call it hard enamel or imitation hard enamel, IHE or soft cloisonne. This is kind of like Elmer's glue. And so when they put it in, they'll kind of, bubble it right up and over the top of the metal, you know, cause it's thick and you have to give them nice big spaces to put it in because it's so thick that if you have a tiny space, it might not actually stick down in the hole. Uh -huh. if, if they go to brush it, it might just pop off. Then when it's all done, they hit it with a grinder and the grinder is like a big flat stone and it will shake back and forth and just, just absolutely, you know, shine it to a finish like a rock polisher. And it's super smooth. And so sometimes you'll see those geo coins where they're, where they're, you know, it's really obvious. You've got lots of dips and pools in your coins, or there's lot, you know, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of variation, or it's up and down. And you can act, you can even color up or cover up three D with this with this pooling, or by making this extra trough, I got two layers of violet without any raised enamel to separate them. Mm. The same thing in here, you get different levels of color. Even though I've only got two colors, I've got, you know, four variations by changing the depth. So in 2D, it bakes and you see these sort of like, um, you'll see these edges where it's kind of dipped down in like a puddle that's drying up. So it's darker along the edge, lighter towards the middle, then darker on the edges again. And that's, you know, that's something that you'll see a lot with 2D. You see it, especially like right here. With IHG or soft clay zone, because they've ground it to a fine, to a fine finish, polished it. It's absolutely smooth on the top. It's all exactly the same level. Okay. And usually it's a lot heavier, I've noticed. It's kind of an odd effect that you get... Um, that even though it's a thinner finish, it makes a fur coin that's much, much heavier. But people have their favorites. Some people love IHG, some people hate it. Some people love soft, some people hate it. It's it's all gonna be, it's gotta come back to supporting the, your idea. I think that's the problem, or the, the the most important thing to remember. The, oh yeah, I had a, I had a, uh, an okay, not okay. So with hard enamel, because they have to kind of fill it where it's right over. If they have a space, we don't give them enough space. These, you know, these marks start to, you know, meld together when you go to bake it. So we have to make sure that they have enough space between them. So sometimes need a little more space and a little less fine detail with the IHE style because they're going to grind it down. If, if they start to mix, they're just going to grind it down deeper and they'll just remove more and more of that material until there's no, you know, until there's no, you know, contamination between the two. Okay. Is there any software that like checks this as a, someone who does a lot with software? Is there any, like, there's so many, there's so many things that you as a designer need to pay attention to, but has anything been automated yet or? Not that I know of, which is why I ended up writing the book because there were so many of these little things that if you didn't know, you would get frustrated and quit or you would, expect and we're unhappy with but if you're armed with what you know then it's amazing what you can do um i've had i've had coins with very very limited budgets that are some of the coins i'm the most proud of because the work is some of the best work i've done and even though they had very little to you know and we're talking like you know tag budget and they're making coins okay and they've come out beautifully because we knew that in advance and we knew how to manipulate a little bit of this stuff. But this was just learned by 
by time and experience and messing up enough times to learn. And so in an effort to not let people experience that same frustration that I experienced for years, I just wrote it down and said, this is, you know, I'm, the, the book is mostly, here's what you don't do, or this is what you need to keep in mind because it can, you know, this, the fact that this is going to work like this might make your colors not be all the same. If you want every color of red to be exactly the same, you have to keep it in mind when you're designing. But if you want four different levels of red and you only want to pay for one enamel color, you could use this to your advantage. And that's, that's really what the artistry part of it comes into. And the, just the experience part of it has been very helpful. Um, Why don't you tell everyone what the name of the book is, by the way, in case people don't know. Oh, um, the book is called Discovered Memoirs of a Geocaching Designer uh, or a Geocoin Designer. Um, the, the, I'm going to close this out for a second. Um, Oops. Hold on. The thing I was, uh, was talking about is uh, how size is measured on a coin. But the, um, the book was basically a collection of, of sketches and ideas and the things that inspired me some of the coins that I saw and I thought that's amazing. That's something I want to do. Um, and part of the book, you know, I wanted to leave space at the end of the book for people to write down their ideas because I'm one of those people that constantly walk around with a pad of paper in his pocket or, you know, now with a, with a phone, but I still prefer paper. I still sketch out almost everything with a, um, a Bic number two medium blue ink nothing else that's the only that's the only um writing instrument that works for <laughs> for designing coins um for pretty much any designing for me i just that's what i prefer um and it gives me a realistic idea the medium the big medium two gives me a line width that's approximate to what metal could be when with a 2d design and so um it helps to just be consistent you know with anything um, the one, the one other thing that I wanted to talk about was, uh, shaped versus round coins. I have the, I have a conversation a lot where people say, you know, I, you know, if they're not round, they're not coins. Well, okay. But coins didn't start out round coins became round. They used to always be shaped. In fact, they were 3d when they first came out. Um, the earliest coins were, um, small carved dolphins and they were fully 3d like small toys. Um, but they became they became flat, I think, mostly through warfare and conquest. The idea was a coin would tell a story about where it was from by the markings that were in the die. And that was the point of cutting a die. You would cut a die in stone, basically a flat tabletop, and you would measure out the right amount of metal and you would pour it in there. And it would have a sloppy edge, but it would take that imprint and they would pop it loose and that's why when you look at all the doubloons, they have all the funky edges that aren't really round because they were just kind of blobbing it on top. They were only they were only worried about the weight measure. Um, but the die mark could tell you who found it, where it came from, where it was going to, who it belonged to at the moment, who was doing the merchant transaction, what route it was taking, who was um, what part of the royalty was accepting it at the other end. It was it was kind of it was an entire story written in the coin. And that's, that's something that's just magical to me. That's something that I always want to try to impart or put into a coin design as I want there to be a story behind it. There's, there's just so much information that you can put into such a small moniker and to have it all at one spot. It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, Oh, if you could bring the screen back up for just a second, I wanted to show this. Uh, we were talking about um, measured uh, coins, how coins are measured. And I've had people, you know, want a want a shaped coin. So say this is the coin shape, this darker red in the middle. And they said, well, it's only it's only this wide in charging me from the very, very outside edge to the very, very outside edge. Well, because we were talking about the forces that those mints smash the metal with, there's a, a pre-required amount of metal that has to go from the very tip, you know, the very most outside point of that design to the edge that 
changes how big that mold has to be, which changes how much material and how big a press it has to go on to and everything else. So they charge for your size by this one piece. So you could have a coin, you know, that is literally that thin that costs three times as much as a coin this big just because it's the outside edge to the outside edge. And it gets exp exponentially more expensive when they, when they do that. Okay. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, whatever your shape is, they're going to measure it from that very most outside edge. And that will help determine the cost of your coin. There's a lot of things that will determine the cost of coin. And we can talk about that a little bit more. And um, you've, you've done non-round coins also besides just yes yes i've done a few I actually um i've i've uh this this is one that was a that was a lot of fun this is what we just did for headquarters a short time ago and an idea but it's about i think about two inches tall two and a half inches tall and it's heavy it's solid and the idea was we were we wanted they wanted the Trinity, the headquarters, eight, and the original stash, all on one coin. And the bottom, of course, is the trackable part, and it's the geocaching trifecta. Those original three. And so, yeah, I've, every once in a while you get you get some really unusual pieces. Um, my latest favorite is the one I wear every day. And it's a coin, and it's trackable on the edge. I don't know if you can see that. Well, it's track. It's. When I say there's a code right there in the middle, but it's. We had an idea for a competition award a oh, short time back, and the idea was something that you would be able to wear and care and have every day, and it would kind of be that reminder, you know, cash a day, you know, don't forget to go have fun, and so I wanted one that was really simple. And you could, you know, you can put an aller, you know, you can put the uh, the faux alligator skin, you know, band on it or whatever you want. But it's it's simple enough, and it's you know comfortable enough to wear that you can wear it every day. And I've actually had a number of people surprised, you know, just stop me and say, "I just noticed your wrist. Are you a casher?" And I would be three counties away at a little league game, and they saw that, you know, they saw that, you know, on my wrist, and they were like, "Oh, I have to. There's a cash nearby. You got to get it while you're here." <laughs> And it's amazing, you know, that that community, they notice that, you know, it's like noticing the, the sticker on somebody's bumper, you know, they'll, right. they make a point of stopping to say hello, which is pretty neat, which is what's kind of great about, you know, caching. Yeah, geocachers are amazing wherever in the world you are. It's just, everyone's so, so friendly. Cache yeah. Line is proposing a trackable belt buckle. What do you think? We had talked about doing that a while back. There was a... um. I forget why we didn't do it. It might have been the size, the size issue. Um, we could do it, but it was going well. You know how the big the Texas buckles were. Yeah. We had talked about doing one that would be a belt buckle, but I wonder if a like a dress belt buckle would be something that would be possible. I have made um I have made one that went on the strap of your swag bag. Like if you had a backpack, I made one that was the same strap or the same size as a three quarter inch strap, so you could actually thread it onto your bag. But I like the belt buckle idea. I guess you have to be careful because people are going to want to get close and take a look at it. So you don't want. Ah, what are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. People, take, people take a lot of photos of things. So I don't know. Maybe not belt buckle. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there. Are, uh, I I I get a lot of a lot of people ask me what you know what's your favorite coin and it changes. It changes. There's there's so many that I've um, that I've been really just blessed to have been uh, a part of the project. But um, there are ones that like that never that I never forget. I know we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but some of the ones that I I am most impressed with are the ones that are made by hand. This is this is the D22, and this is you know one of those that's just absolutely amazing. I wish I could bring my the my, the newest collective. I'm going to bring it back a little bit. It's literally just been worked like, you know, Dremel and, you know, by Dremel stamp in hand. And it's beautiful. It's it's a great piece of work. And I love it. This is a D22. And 
So these hand pieces are the ones that people really put a little of their person, their personal touch on. Those are the ones that really get me going. The one that started me down this whole track of make something that was really unique and really mine. It's the pride of my collection. And I have, I have a sizable collection, but the pride of my collection is the cash and Karen number seven. And this is, I found this in an icy waterfall in New Hampshire in, in January. And it was about minus 35, I think. And it's, been in my collection it's been that sort of one that i show people that like this is this was inspiring um this was someone who spent you know all winter when it was too cold to go caching building these you know one by one and this is this it's just so cool that it was number seven too lucky number seven <laughs> and then going out and putting them in i don't know if you can see that and she signed each one And I just, I love the idea that someone put that much effort into a personal signature because if you've ever done counted cross stitch, it's, it's a labor of love and frustration. Mm -hmm. and so my grandmother uh, was a designer for counted cross stitch patterns. So to find that in one of my first, you know, my first, you know, couple months of caching as a signature item, that was, I was just completely, I was amazed. I was, I, I thought, well, you know, what can I do? What do I know how to do? How can I make an impression? And so that was for me, that was, I wanted to do something that was, you know, it's something that's employed the, the 3d modeling and the drawing and the illustrations and the graphic designs, you know, sort of uh, background that I had. And so there was, there was just no other way I was going to make a coin at some point, but the, uh, the ones with a personal touch, they're always the best. I love finding ones that are made out of female clay ones that are made out of bottle caps. Someone carved them out of wood. Um, Big Al is a local guy, a uh, casher, who does them, um, does them out of a uh, horn. He actually has like pieces of horn that have been polished down and they're beautiful. Um, there's, there's just, there's no limit to how great they are. I, I had collected so many that had inspired me. I eventually went out and put it, I went and put them all in one cache in a big can in the woods and I just called it the signature cache and I get the great, you know, the best logs, you know, where people will email me afterwards and they're like, I spent two hours just photographing all the different, you know, signatures because they're amazing. They're so inspiring. And a lot of those people that, you know, had that inspiration, they went on to make tags and coins and signatures of their own. And that's really what it's about. It's, that's about leaving an indelible mark. Mm -hmm. I kind of, um, I worked for about 20 years in broadcast television and it's it's a demanding job and i worked for um you know in doing animation and graphic design and a lot of your stuff is seen for a very short time and it's seen by millions of people but it's 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 gone in the blink of an eye and i always felt like i wasn't really making a mark um with my work and i complained at it about that fact to, to my wife at one point and she said i don't understand and she and she said i don't know what you you know understand what you mean she said you know, 10,000 years from now, they'll still be digging up your coins. And it was the first time that it really hit me that she didn't see my work at the television station as the work that was my real artistic work. Mm -hmm. the coins, that was the first thing that came to mind. Those are the things that she thought that I'd be leaving behind. And it was a eureka moment for me. And it was, I went from enjoying doing coins to just almost obsessively loving doing coins and then wanting other people to enjoy that experience the same way. It's, there's just something amazing about putting your personal stamp forever in history, you know, in caching, but in, you know, your personal mark on the world in a way that's not going to go away. Right. You know? And that's, that's pretty exciting. That's how many, how many did you do for yourself compared to how many did you do for others? Like what percent do you do for clients and how many, what percent do you do for yourself? Do I design as my own personal coins or do I just design for myself for the love of coins? Just design for yourself for the love of coins. Okay. So I have, I've, I've had a really wonderful working relationship with the GeoCoin club. And over the years, they've really given me free reign to sort of explore what I wanted to do. And not every designer is, is, you know, is a blockbuster. I mean, and that's, and they've been very understanding about allowing me to sort of flex the creative muscles and ask more from the mint and try to get them to cross barriers. But because they've given me that sort of 
you know, they, a lot of, you know, I'll say, Hey, do you, do you, I'm planning to do these three coins next or these three designs next. Do you want to something in a particular order? Do you have some ideas? Or they'll say, Hey, for March, could you try this? Or can you, for January, could you try that? But they've just given me a little bit of free reign, come up with good ideas, throw a good idea. If we like it, we'll say, yeah, and you can just go for it. And so that, that's such a rare opportunity, but I don't, and, and you kind of get that opportunity after you have a long track record of, of, of pulling it off, you know, and tastefully and, and doing it well, but in a way that, you know, sort of, you know, uh, is applicable to everyone, you know, kids and, and, and adults, you know, and everyone in between could kind of enjoy, but they, they gave me the ability to try new things. And that was huge. So I would say, you know, I, I last couple of years that they, they've let me do, you know, 12 designs a year and, you know, at least once a month I get to do, I get to do a coin design purely for the love of the coin design. And I could just, it's whatever I can dream of. And so there's always new ideas. There's always, you know, the next thing around the corner. Um, and so that's kind of wild. That's for me, that's, that's kind of like the dessert in my month of work. You know, that's the thing that I look forward to because that's the one that, you know, it's just do good, do good work, you know, and, and we'll give you the go. And so, yeah, that's been, that's been really great. And that's, that's some of the work that I'm really proud of too, because I have to make a lot of people happy. You know, I get to explore my creativity, but I have to also make sure that everybody else out there has something, you know, in that, you know, in those 12 months that really speak to them personally too. Right. So, it's a little bit of, um, there's a lot of thought involved. I would say on average on any geocoin design, I might think about it from anywhere from, I don't know, a week to a year on an idea and I'll keep writing down. I keep directories that just have an idea. I have a coin that I'm, I've been working on since 2005. I haven't finished. So, okay. and, and every day once in a while, I just put down some more notes on it, but okay. Every once in a while, those they'll come back up and you just grab that and you start pulling it out and you've been inspired. Something, something you saw inspired you in a new way and you just go for it. And so that is always a lot of fun. Um, if I'm working with someone else, it's always much, much faster because they've been thinking about this for a long time. And if they're new to the idea, you know, it's they're sort of in the discovery and I get to do it with them. And so that's a wonderful opportunity too. And a lot of times, kind of like we, we did tonight, I'll get to design live on my computer while they're watching on their computer and they'll say, hey, can you make this bigger? Can you make that smaller? Can you change that color? And we get to collaborate and collaboration, man, that's, that's the best. That's just so much more fun than working alone. Even when it's a coin, you know, even when it's a design, you just love to explore the idea. Collaborating is always the best. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, sometimes some people might not like that, but it's great that you do. Some people might want to work in a bubble to not have other people, you know, mess it, around with their ideas, but that sounds great that you do it's that. It's tempting, but I don't know if you grow if you do that. Right. You know, and yep. so I'm always looking for the next thing. And we, and we have had clients that just, you know, they give you, you know, the, the ideas they come up with are amazing. You know, that's, um, I think one of my most fun projects each year is to work with the Tri-Cities. The Tri-Cities uh, Geocoin Challenge is always, they always have great ideas. They always have really high aspirations and they're willing to take big risks to get, you know, really unique stuff. And so that's a lot of fun. The, um, I think the, uh, I have one from them. Uh, one of the ideas I said, we have an idea that just floats around. This was an idea from maybe 2006. It was an idea I had for making a tool to go find a cache in the woods. And let's see if I can. The idea was that you would make, and it was kind of a, it's kind of funny. They called it uh, the Goonies coin because it was actually a site marker. So we had to come up with a way that you would use this as a physical tool and you had to help hold it at a set distance from your face and look at the horizon line and you would locate four different markers or, you know, on the horizon line. Wow. And when these coins, each one of them is separate, makes when they're, when each one of them is uh, separate, there might just be a little bit of a curve right here in the middle. But when you put all four of them together, that curve, becomes a full circle 
and that circle shows you the final location of the cache. And so the idea of, of mixing all these elements together, oh, there it is, that's a little better. Uh, yeah, so that, when you finally look through that final circle, and it would show you the final location, responses from from the people when they went to do do it and they said you know it was the most fun you know that they had you know they said it was so exciting to see people you know who might be you know you know in their 50s and 60s you know out there just they look like six-year-old kids they're like oh i got a new toy you know <laughs> it's cool and it works it actually works um but it takes you know like i said it, it's it's a you know it's working it's a leap of faith to explore a new idea but you know, each year they, they push me to try something even even more, you know, even more, I guess, uh, not necessarily difficult, but more imaginative. So I'm really excited about what's coming up. We've got some really great work. And uh, I've been working with uh, Compass Coins on a project for them. And it's really, it's really pretty outstanding. Yeah. Cash Alliance says, I've been trying to think of ways for coins and tags to think outside of the box, as it were. That's a great idea. See, like, I love, well, I love that is amazing. That serve a function are kind of kind of awesome. Yeah, I mean, I I'm used to just having coins. I have my my little bag of coins that I take with me to all my different events. But you know, most of them are just like you were saying, circles. So some of the cooler ones, like I have a. This is just. Oh right, I remember that. This is from when I was in the film festival, which is kind of cool, right? Obviously not a circle, not as, not as, you know, and this one, this one is just like the one you, this has the same HQ that you were showing. It must like, that's the same right. logo, I guess, as your, as your pyramid one or tetrahedron right. one. But um, I just, yeah, I always just go keep them because like each one has a story for me. And it sounds like that's what you like to do is, Every design that you do has a story or a meaning or something special to either you or somebody. And it you're is. basically turning that dream into something physical. It is. And that's and it's great. It, and, it, and it comes to you in the most unexpected times, too. Um, I love to, I'm always, I'm just, I think it's the learning part of it, like learning new stuff that I'm just kind of addicted to. But um, I, I love looking at um, mythology and legends from other uh, cultures and stuff. And, and I've worked on coins where, I learned what was behind it, and I thought that's the most amazing thing. I love this, and then I, I'm like, and, and if nobody else ever gets it, you know, that's too bad. But you know, I, I know what it is, and I love it for that reason. And then uh, I remember someone sing. I I turn. I was at a table. I was helping somebody at a booth, and all of a sudden, I heard this scream behind me, and someone was jumping up and down, and they were um they were holding the coin, and she said, "Do you know what this is?" And 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 she was. And then she was switching in and out of German and I didn't understand the German, but she was very excited and she was talking to someone excitedly next to her. And then, and she was getting so frustrated, she couldn't, she flustered, she couldn't put her words together. But, and uh, the gentleman that was with her was like, oh, he said, uh, he said, that's the Waldgeist. And I said, yeah. And he's, and, he, and she's like, do you know what this is? And I'm like, yeah. And, and so she was telling me, she saw that she'd never seen the coins. She was there because her boyfriend was a cashier but she saw this coin and that like changed everything. She's like, there's, you know, there's people here that understand things that are important to my culture, you know, in, inside of this game. And that was like for, that was an eye opening and wonderful experience for me, but also for her to realize that it crosses boundaries, you know, um, as far as like, you know, uh, it, the world just became a very, you know, much smaller place and we get to share something together through a coin, which is great. It was a lot of that's cool. So, you have any? Are you going to do another book now that you have uh, your your, one, your first memories of a geocoin designer, Volume One? You, you're talking yeah. about these ideas that you still have and your thoughts about lessons learned as you design. I I do. Um, I started on Volume Two almost immediately after Volume One, and something kind of wonderful and terrible happened right about that time there were people who'd seen volume one and people who heard that I was designing coins and I was available to design coins, you know, cause I wasn't doing it just as a hobby anymore, but I was actually, you know, accepting them as, as regular design work as a job. I actually got so busy, like immediately following that I didn't get a chance to like slow down and keep writing. And then I also became a dad right at the same time. 
Oh, congratulations. So I had, you know, I have a kid who was, you know, he was taking karate and now he's in little league baseball and that's just life for him. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, you know, life took a little bit of a detour, but I've started to actually compose and collect my notes and stuff together. And I want to, and now printing has changed too. The first time I did this, I had to put out way more money than I should have safely done at the time to make that book. Um, but now with print on demand options and stuff like that, there's, you know, there's a lot less holding me back. So I'm really excited about the idea of kind of getting back to working on that project. Wow. A lot has changed in that time. Wow. So yeah, I, I'm definitely, it's definitely on my mind all the time. Okay. Interesting. Does it, I just want to make sure if any, does anyone watching have any questions? Mm -hmm. I've been trying to pop up things as I can, but I just want to make sure um, that I don't miss any questions that people have for, for Chris. Um, all right. And I guess, um, I mean, my my last question is like, um, what's like the coolest thing that you're working on now that you that you, or is this is everything kind of private until you until you release things? Yeah. Well, normally I don't really get to tell people, you know, what I'm working on because it's not really mine to share. I kind of right. wait for them to do the share. Um, but like I said, the the tri you know the tri cities in Washington does always that's always a lot of fun. Um, but there's the technology shifted all of a sudden this last year, and there's some new there's some new options to add to coins that have never really been exercised before. And I'm kind of curious to see how that goes. So I have a couple of projects I'm working on, but the coolest new one that I'm working on right now that we can I think it was just kind of shared a couple of days ago is Midwest Geobash has a functional coin for their Flamingo Club. And they really went over the top. There's some really cool stuff. It's going to be, um, it's going to have multiple layers of fun involved in it. And it's the kind of fun that can last for quite a while, you know, for days of, of event fun. So I'm really excited to see how the response will be to that. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I see Kyle Powell says, hey, Chris, once just a shout out to say hello. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for joining us tonight. See my shell is asking: Is your book available on Amazon? Um, I don't think it's available anymore. It's been about I want to say it's been like nine years or ten years since uh, it came out. So there are still a few of them that are out there floating around. Every once in a while, I see them um, pop up. I know I'm pretty sure um, JP's Geo Designs in Estonia still has a few, and I've got you know I've got a box or two of that I've just kind of held on to that I wanted to sort of like put out there when volume two comes out. But um, there's there's still a few out there. Um, you can always reach out to me and I can ask around and I'll find one for you if you're having trouble finding one. How many did you print originally? Did book? There were, I want to say there were um, a thousand trackable um, limited editions. And then we did like another thousand that were not limited editions. They were uh, they were not trackable. They were just kind of uh, a copy, but they had a, a different cover design. And most of the trackables disappeared pretty quickly. And a lot of non-trackables, they were around for a while. And then a lot of them were, were damaged um, just because they were moved, you know, moved around too long or sat too long. So I don't know how many were actually out there anymore, but I guess there's probably about a thousand altogether that are probably out there in the world somewhere. Okay. Um, and of course it's and it's in the US Library of Congress, which is always cool. That's really neat. Cash Line says that his he has one and it's number six hundred and forty three out of a thousand. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Cash Line's an awesome geocacher from uh, Ontario. So he's okay. he's been very supportive of my channel and helping me get started with a lot of this stuff. And I know he's very into collecting things like that. So cool. I very much appreciated. All right. Yeah. Well, I don't really have any more questions for you. I just want to say thank you so much for this time. Um, sure. I mean, I could, I, I can keep listening to you forever. I just, <laughs> you know, I just no, I'll, I'll talk forever if you let me, because I love to talk about it. Um, the things that I think the things that we didn't really talk too much about would probably be like, what do you do? Like, if you want to make a coin, like, what are the things you need to do? Um, and the things that there's really just three things that would be kind of, you know, we talk one about is kind of make a priority list of what needs to be on your coin, no matter how bizarre it is, no matter how eclectic it is. You know, if dancing bananas is your thing, then that's, you know, that's your thing. Put it on there, put it on your list as a high priority, you know, um, but put together that list of what's really important to you. The other thing is um, decide what you want to do with your coin. 
Is your coin something that you want to make that's just for you to leave in caches? Um, is it something that you want to trade? Does it need to be trackable? Um, does it, you know, do, are you planning to sell them or, you know, find out, like figure out what you want to do with your coin because that will dramatically change what, how you look at your coin and also what it costs to produce a coin. Um, the different things that the different choices that you make early on can make a coin, you know, very, very inexpensive. We're talking like, you know, a couple bucks a coin all the way up to very, very, very expensive, you know, hundreds of dollars a coin. So, but on average, you know, you can still do coins at a, at a pretty reasonable rate. There's still ways to do it. If you know in advance, kind of have an idea of what you want to do with it, that can really help on, on your budget. Um, I've made coins for just for me, you know, for, for my family members and stuff. Um, and they've been everywhere from about $12 a piece down to under $2 a piece. Okay. So there's lots of options out there. So I would say decide what you want to do with your coin, decide what needs to be on your coin, and then sort of figure out what your budget is because the budget isn't the breaker. A lot of times people get stuck on the idea of like, I can't afford to do the coin, but you can do it in stages. You don't have to do it all at once. You can have, you can do your de uh, design one year and you can do your samples another year. You could have your production line done a year after that. So you can do steps. It's, it's a personal, it's a deeply personal project and you got to be willing to sort of let it grow with you as, as your budget and your timing allows for it to happen. Okay. I think if you don't try to push it, it could be really enjoyable. It could be fun, and it's actually affordable. I didn't think it was in the beginning, and, and I was wrong. And then I realized why so many people make coins. It really does. It does work. So yeah, I would say those are the things that I think would are those are the hardest parts. And then just find someone who likes to do the design work because you know translating your ideas into you know, ideas that can actually be used by the mint, that's probably the next big step. Okay. But that's, you know, that's why people like myself, you know, we love our jobs. <laughs> yeah, it's really something I need to do be. because it's actually something where I need to figure out, like my logo is, so I'm Geo Elmo 6000. It started from when I first started, my daughter was very young. She was sitting with me and had her Elmo, right? So mm -hmm. I took a picture of her Elmo with my GPS. And <laughs> for the last nine years, that's been my logo, right? So. I want to change it at some point, but that's something where I need to start thinking about, like we were talking about with the coin, almost like design a coin in my mind, and actually maybe even design a coin itself that really brings into what what is this to me, right? That's not just an Elmo and a GPS photograph anymore, but you know, like what you're talking about. What what are what are the things I love? I love filmmaking. I love interesting ca caches. You know, all that kind of stuff, and that's all from geocaching. So exactly. Really that's getting that priority list. It's amazing. Like you'll write it all down and then you'll look at it, you know, the next day and you're like, why did I do that? You know, my daughter's so much more, so much higher on the list, you know, and you'll move things around. You'll, it's, it clarifies things for you. It's really, it's kind of a, it's nice. It's kind of a soul searching um, expedition. Yeah. So I'm definitely gonna have to put that on my list and I'm writing down your three, your three things and I'm going to apply that because it's, it's, I think it's a really great idea. Uh, I have a couple of people just commenting. I want to say, so Houston, Texas, Dave says, great show. Thank you to both of us. And thank you. Shirley says, thanks guys. She learned a few things. Cash line. Thanks so much. Geocoins has been on his radar design for design for years. Um, so that's, you know, and I agree with him. That's definitely a bigger beast than path tags, but um, your everything you said was like so helpful to, yeah, they can they can apply to tags too. Um, and you know, I've done I've done micro coins too, which are just slightly larger than tags, but not as large as some of the full size coins. So, but the process is still the same. I, I would say start anywhere if that's what your budget allows, then do that. But just start the process. I think that's the hard part. The first step is always the hardest. Yeah, getting started right. Mm -hmm. Joe Rick says. Thank you for bo both. This was so interesting. So just want to make sure everyone knows that you know that everyone's saying thank you. That this was a very interesting interview. I appreciate. It. I just like I said, I'll talk about coins anytime you let me. So <laughs> all right. Well, maybe we can do another session sometime. We can talk about sure. this if there's something we want to focus on. But I really learned a lot. I want to say thank you. Um, I should probably wrap this up. 
But uh, thank you very much, Chris, for your time. This, I mean, this to me, this is so interesting and amazing. I'm an engineer. My mind's whirring as I'm listening to how, how you're talking about all this stuff happening. And it's inspiring, definitely inspiring me to figure out a coin that I would love to design. So really, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Sure. And I want to thank everyone who's been watching. Um, thank you for the people who are watching live and the people who are watching this in replay. Um, I appreciate you to, you know, your comments and your questions and make sure you leave a comment below. Um, if you have any questions for Chris that maybe I can forward on to him or he can check later. Um, and I really appreciate you watching and thank you and have a great night and a great weekend. Good night. Safe trails.